podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Here, we love talking about everything Batman. The BatmanUniverse.net has news, original content, and reviews about Batman comics, movies, TV shows, video games, and more. Check out the BatmanUniverse.net and join our Discord server to start chatting with fellow fans. We can't wait to talk to you guys. Also, visit our Patreon page and join our other awesome supporters. But enough of this nonsense. On with the show. Gotham City, like any other large metropolis, abounds in girls of all shapes and sizes. Debutantes, nurses, stenographers, and librarians. Gotham City Library, Miss Gordon speaking. Lopez hair removal, this is Jose. Holy transformation. One minute, plain Barbara Gordon, librarian and Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And the next minute, something new has been added. Batgirl, modeled after her idol, Batman. Holy apparition. No, boy wonder, I'm Batgirl. You are no longer alone, Cape Crusader. It took me three years to track down the Jade Gatto, and three more to figure out how to steal it. Funny, it only took me ten minutes to figure out how to snatch it back. No matter how you do it, crime doesn't pay girls. Awete, Mihi Nomen Est, Stella, at Hawk Est, Backroll the Oracle, The Barbara Gordon Podcast, Episode 241 for December MMXXIII and the 14th anniversary. Backroll the Oracle is brought to you by MileHighComics.com, your new and collectible comic book store. Mile High Comics has an inventory of over 5 million comics from the gold, silver, bronze, and modern age, and over 100,000 trade paperbacks. If you're not into the vintage stock, Mile High Comics also has a subscription service called the New Issue Comics Express, offering a discounted price for comics ready to hit the shelves. So if you're looking for vintage back issues or a great modern subscription service, be sure to check out MileHighComics.com. Because this is the last episode of the year, I thought I would go through my favorites of 2023. 2023 was a bit better than 2022, but here's hoping that 2024 is finally my year. I think I've gotten beat up enough. And goals for 2024 is to graduate with my master's in education, to get my licensure as an educator, and to get financially stable job and not have to have four sources of income and also get a new place to live. So that would be great. So let's just get into it with the favorites of 2023. And I would love for you all to to write in and tell me what some of your favorites were and whether you have some goals of 2024 as well. So first up, and I'm just using uh, last year, if you recall, I just kind of went through different topics and said what my, my top thing was. And this is borrowed a little bit from my friendly rivals at Quinoa but have just made it my own. So first of all, my favorite video game. Now on my birthday, actually the day before maybe, I had received an email from Best Buy that FedEx was dropping a package off on my on my birthday. And whenever I get these emails, either from UPS or some sort of shipping thing, and I know that I haven't gotten, bought something, I always get nervous that some fraudulent activity has happened on my credit card. And so I double check, like, no, I haven't 
I haven't bought anything. Where is this coming from? Did some sleuthing. The Best Buy. It was shipping from a Best Buy in Pennsylvania. I'm like, I have no idea what this is. So birthday, hanging around. I get a large package. And I was like, it better not be what I think it is. And in fact, it was. It was a PlayStation 5. So then there was a mystery of who had sent this because I did not buy the PS5 because I think I, I was very clear that I was not financially stable enough to really reason through and make it make sense for me to get such a big item. So there were there was a small number of people that could have done this. And uh, I thought back to when I got the Batgirl and Nightwing statue, because that was another mystery. And, you know, first went to to my mom and I was like, did you? But I hadn't really talked about it because it's not like I'm going to ask for Christmas, this large ticket item. And then the next person that I went to was in fact. So I'll just call this person a mysterious benefactor. I both, you know, love this person as well as will strangle them the next time I see them because of this purchase. But I am very appreciative. So, of course, Marvel Spider-Man 2 was the bundle with it. That was the reason it was just so hard to watch my friends have it and play it. And obviously, I was staying off social media because I didn't want to know anything about it. And I was just like, I can wait. I can hold out until I get this, you know, in the fall of 2024 as a gift to myself. Maybe that I've got a new place, got a great job, fingers crossed, and, you know, get it. But here we are. So Marvel Spider-Man 2 is my favorite game so far. I've been loving it. Luckily, there's only one minor spoil that happened accidentally as I was scrolling through Instagram, just like a villain popped up in photo mode. And I was like, I didn't know this villain was in the game. So I felt minorly spoiled, but he was actually the, the first villain that you end up fighting. And yeah, I've just been taking my time. You know, I'll do a mission or two and then I'll swing through the city and look around and do side missions. And I'm just loving it. The story is as engaging as always. The people are engaging so much so that, you know, I'm getting annoyed at Peter for kind of blowing miles off consistently. And I have the black suit now, which isn't a spoil because that is something that you see in the ads and everything. And boys is, is it fun, but I'm also nervous as to where it's going. And then Craven just being probably the deadliest version of Craven that I've ever seen him and his, his hairy body. So yeah, just taking my time, but loving it. And now I'm off this week. So I'm just, except for Michael's, I'll, I'll go there a couple of times, but I'm just loving being able to do nothing really productive and, and play that game. And so it's just, uh, it's just great. And all the emotions and great story beats. I'm sorry that I didn't get any game of the year awards or any game awards. I think that's kind of silly. I think a lot of the things went to Baldur's Gate probably because everybody wants to have sex with the bear, but yeah, I just can't recommend this enough and still making my way through. I feel like I only just finished act one, even though it says I'm 46% through, but that's because I'm doing a lot of the, the side stuff and things in the city, but just getting the suit. I don't know that I'm very far in, so we'll, we'll see next up my top comic book of the year. While I still do really love Nightwing kind of behind on that. I will say, honestly, as a sleeper, and a surprise, I'm going to give it to Birds of Prey by Kelly Thompson and Leonardo Romero. I think even though we will do issue number four, and so it's really only been coming out half of the year, started, I guess, September was the first issue that came out. I'm very surprised, happily, for sure, don't get me wrong, that I love this so much. I think that it's so good and that I eagerly await the next issue. And I think the writing is great and, and each of the characters, their voices are really coming through and they're each distinct and there's just a lot of fun moments. And I'm just looking forward to see what this team holds in store and what this book holds in store as well. So not a lot to say because I'm just going to talk about it in the next half of this episode, but I think that's my top comic book of 2023. For book, I'm going to give you two of them. And both of them I highly recommend. First of all, Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. This one I gave a five out of five. And I don't often do that. I had actually a couple five out of fives this year. So 
if I, I'll give you the synopsis for this one, I, I have talked about it before. And of course, there is an Apple series starring Brie Larson that I recommend, but I always, always go for the book first. So chemist Elizabeth Zott is not your average woman. In fact, Elizabeth Zott would be the first to point out that there's no such thing as an average woman. But it's the early 1960s and her all-male team at Hastings Research Institute takes a very unscientific view of equality except for one, Calvin Evans, the lonely, brilliant Nobel Prize nominated grudge holder who falls in love with, of all things, her mind, true chemistry results. But like science, life is unpredictable, which is why a few years later, Elizabeth Zott finds herself not only a single mother, but the reluctant star of America's most beloved cooking show, Supper at Six. Elizabeth's unusual approach to cooking, quote, combine one tablespoon acetic acid with a pinch of sodium chloride, end quote, proves revolutionary. But as her following grows, not everyone is happy because as it turns out, Elizabeth Zott isn't just teaching women to cook, she's daring them to change the status quo. Laugh out loud, funny, shrewdly observant, and studded with a dazzling cast of supporting characters. Lessons in chemistry is an original, is as original and vibrant as the protagonist. And I fully agree with that. I remember seeing this when I was visiting my family, maybe for Thanksgiving, went to Barnes and Noble and saw this displayed everywhere. And I was like, what is this? And, you know, recommends and it was just like the book it seemed like. And so I went and got it from the library because I never trust those displays. Actually, I guess I'm just like a true nonconformist and ate it up, loved it. Love the voice of Elizabeth Zott. 100% agree with this, that the, the, cast of characters like the the, everyone who is surrounding Elizabeth Zott has their own distinct voice as well some of them have their own like POVs that will pop in and uh, there are some serious subject matters that come in as well and of course the time period being really is interesting so highly recommend this book I really really loved it and it is on one of my lists that I have that I want to own this book, but I haven't been buying books at all because I know I'm going to be moving and the books is what makes me the most nervous about packing up and moving. So I'm like, I don't need any more yet until I move and I am settled. The other book I talked about because I read it in the summer for my young adult literature class and I recommend it to other people just because I think it is amazing. Uh, I think it's really beautiful and creative and powerful. It is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. Xiomara Batista feels unheard and unable to hide in her Harlem neighborhood. Ever since her body grew into curves, she has learned to let her fists and her fierceness do the talking. But Xiomara has plenty she wants to say, and she pours all her frustration and passion onto the pages of the leather notebook, reciting the words to herself like prayers, especially after she catches feelings for a boy in her bio class named Amon, whom her family can never know about. With mommy's determination to force her daughter to obey the laws of the church, Siamara understands that her thoughts are best kept herself. So when she is invited to join her school slam poetry club, she doesn't know how she could ever attend without her mommy finding out. But she still can't stop thinking about performing her poems. Because in the face of a world that may not want to hear her, Siamara refuses to be silent. The novel is in verse and it is, it would have been the second one that I would have read in verse ever. The first one would have been a Jason Reynolds that we read that was like a pre-read book of week zero. And this one, yeah, it was just amazing. It was certainly something that I could do in an English classroom or a book club and really look at the language and do close readings. And then the topics as well, you know, that this tension between family and religion, body positivity, as well as consent, and also uh, young boys and, and how they are looking at her as well and, and reacting to her and things like that. So definitely teachable moments for young women and young men and just really an amazing read. So highly recommend this as well. And yet another example of why, why a lit is not something that you should just snub your nose at because there are great, there are great books in there. Top anime of the year is Suzume, which came out, I think in Japan in 2022, but I had seen it in 2023. And I have already talked about this as well, but just the, the, Short synopsis is a modern action adventure road story where a 17 year old girl named Susan May helps a mysterious young man close down doors from the other side that are releasing disasters all over in Japan and very much a story about grief, of course, that 
young mysterious man turns into a three-legged chair and family and uh by the creators of of your name and i think weathering with you and five centimeters per second all of those yeah I, I think i talked about it when ian miller was on because we had both seen this but yeah just really powerful shocking moments also and i remember the aunt yelling at his man still waiting for this to become available in the u.s so i can purchase it and watch it again but highly recommend that and i'll talk about the boy and the heron the second half because i'd recently seen that but the two share i think themes uh, which made it difficult to watch or i guess fully appreciate the boy and the heron because uh, my issue is if I see something and love it and then find something else that is similar to it, then I don't appreciate that one as much. But Susan May would have definitely been my top. Okay, so now we're getting into some music here. And I wanted to, for the first time ever, I got to do Spotify Wrapped. And I guess people get embarrassed by their Spotify Wrapped, which I find really interesting. But I I am not embarrassed. I, I'll a- absolutely explain though what these are not of embarrassment just just because like oh this is interesting so here's why spotify rap 100 makes sense that ali and aj were number one i'm surprised that one of their songs weren't number one but that's quite all right but yeah that that is totally me i mean they're gonna pop up two more times on my best of list so ali and aj number two i was surprised to see gustavo santiago composer of the last of us but i often listen to either the last of us or even right now i'm listening to the the marvel spider-man soundtrack when i'm doing work work like uva work or if i'm doing school work and so i think that's why that popped up and then the last three canons mr wives and metric um mr wives had come out with a new album so i was checking that out and then canons and metric just kind of getting to know them a bit better because i had a couple songs that i bought from them singles and and wanted to see what their their full discography was like so i was watching those but it's interesting that they they pull that because i feel like well i was listening to 30 seconds from mars too so i'm surprised that that didn't pop up but i guess time wise it makes most sense top songs so some of these i would say two and three definitely make sense because i'm going to talk about them again but one four and five and and i guess really all of them the reason why they're there and overcomings by nothing but thieves and i will listen on spotify to a curated playlist that is based off of the Sirius XM alt nation at the time. So songs that are coming into play and I'll do this often when I'm playing uh, video games with Harry that don't require me to listen to sound like um, fall guys or even uh, aliens for team elite. And so I remember overcome was like the first song on that playlist for a while. So that is number, that is definitely why that's number one. Cause I would just play that all the time when I press play on that alt list, not strong enough and blame Brett, Totally makes sense why I have that. I was even listening to, or uh, yeah, I listened to Boy Genius's full album and then also The Beaches. The Way by Manchester Orchestra, again, still on that list. There's someone that I buy their music uh, fully, their full album. So I have that full uh, EP. And then Hello would have been by, um, shoot, I've forgotten their name. It's not Foster the People, but it's, oh, darn. But anyway, so those are all on that particular one. So not surprised at all, not embarrassed at all. Allie and AJ, thank you for being there. You lead me into, actually, both of those categories lead me in there. And it's interesting. It says modern rock. I would say alternative rock, but that all makes sense. So, yeah, we get into it now. So the album of the year for me is With Love From by Allie and AJ. And this is their second full length album since, you know, way back when, when they were were Disney Channel kids. And of course my number one from uh, really the previous year, I would say was, was um, The Touch of the Beat. So it explores Americana, folk music, indie pop, and it has influences from country music. And regarding the stylistic choice, AJ said, quote, I think being that Allie and I come from pop songwriting, that will always be an underbelly to our writing but i do think opening up into an americana kind of folk fits ali and i really well it's something that we want to pursue when we were younger 
we also grew up listening to a lot of music that fell into that category. But in a way, when you're a strong songwriter and you're really confident in your work and you're open to working with other people and you're open to diverse ideas, when it comes to kind of floating between genres, I think that's when you can shine because you're not boxing yourself into a genre, end quote. And this is one of the reasons why I love Ally and AJ and they're my favorite group. And I've been told this to them, you know, when I met them is that they evolve so much and they change so much and they are diverse because, you know, even you know, they do have that pop uh, when they were coming out with their EPs, when they had returned, it was very much kind of 80s synth. And then with, a touch of the beat. It was very California feel like beach boys and that sort of thing. And then we, we change again. And so the fact that they are, they're not, they don't fit in a box. They can change. They, they do all these different genres, I think is amazing. And that's why I just think that they're, they're great. Sunchoke is my favorite track on that. And I've already used that once on this podcast on one of these ISIS radio hours. So you're good there. We get into songs and I will be a bit of a snob here. I am a snob, I think, with books and with music or musical theater. So just be aware that I will say some things that are going to be unsettling to some. And it's just my opinion. And you obviously can like what you like. So my number one song of the year, and there is a a uh, an honorable mention is not strong enough by boy genius and boy genius is a group or a super group that's made up of julian baker phoebe bridgers and lucy dacus or dacus and i remember now i don't remember the day but i remember exactly what i was doing when i first heard this i was in fact on the alt nation playlist on spotify i was playing a video game with harry and the first chorus came through and Usually, I mean, it's kind of in the background, right? I'm not necessarily playing uh, or listening intently to the music that's playing when I'm playing a video game, unless I know it, you know, I might hum along or something. And they get to the first chorus and it is three-part harmony. And I remember like it just stopping me and me pausing what I was doing. And I turn over to look at what this is. And then I ended up doing research as to who is Boy Genius? You know, what is this group? listening to that song listening to it over and over again it's an amazing song I recommend looking up I forgot to look up before I started this there was an interview with them where they actually sing it slower and acapella and they talk about you know what their lyrics are, are discussing but but certainly you know like some mental difficulties and and depression and things like that and um yeah g- getting through the day sometimes so definitely listen to the lyrics as, as well as look that up. I can't remember if it was Wired. It might have been Wired, actually. I don't think it was Vulture, but definitely. I'm a sucker for harmonies. I think that if you have more than one member, you should be tapping into harmonies. The fact that they're using three-part harmonies, they're never on the same note, I think is amazing. It's one of the reasons why, here's my controversial note, I don't like K-pop. I just think that K-pop is lazy at times because when you have members, because some of those groups have like upwards of four or five, six, seven members, and I'm not hearing too much. Like maybe I'll hear octave harmonies where someone's on the same note, but different octaves. If you got seven people, you should be using that. Ellie and AJ, they use harmonies. You know, I'm listening to Olivia Rodrigo and the song You Can't Catch Me Now, which is, you know, from Ballad of Songbirds and Serpents. And even just one person, you know, there are segments that there are harmonies. And I just think that you need to tap into that. You know, there's the beauty of music and, and having harmonies. And sometimes maybe what you're singing doesn't you don't want to have that but yeah I just think you know with k-pop there's just no excuse and some people they tell me because k-pop was trying to be forced upon me and and there's a couple songs that I like but the songs that I like have the harmony um that you know they have complicated steps but I think well then I'm going to throw back at you the fact that you know they often lip sync so if they're doing the the steps and they're lip syncing, why can't they be lip syncing to multiple part harmonies? So that is my controversial thought. Again, I know a lot of people like 
Korean pop and uh, definitely you can write me back and explain to me why they don't use harmonies if you so desire. Um, and again, that's a generalization because there are definitely groups that do use uh, harmonies, but I just wish that there were more, especially with seven members. I mean, that would be awesome to hear seven part harmonies coming through on some of those choruses. My honorable mention is Blame Brett by the Beaches. I just think it's a funny song and something that's very catchy. So I'm obviously going to be playing strong enough during Zeiss's radio hour. Blame Brett, I might put at the end, but you know, it's something that I love, but I also wouldn't recommend what's being said in there to other people. I mean, there's a line of don't let me near your friend. Don't friends. Don't let me near your dad. So you can get a kind of a, uh, a sense of what it's about, but I, I do enjoy that song. My favorite TV series, it's interesting. It didn't like come to me very quickly, but I think it's going to be The Last of Us. That was on Max, a great adaptation. Of course, it does raise questions just about, you know, <sighs> this fine line as fans. And it might just be me where you want an adaptation that's close to the video game you're playing. But if it's so close, why aren't you just playing the video game, you know? But if it's not close, then you get upset. So it's it's hard to be in this this weird, I don't know, liminal space. And I feel bad for, for creators because, boy, they, they don't have a lot that they are working with. I don't have a favorite TV episode unlike last year. Nothing really popped out at me like Euphoria's specials did. So I'll move on. Top movie, kind of scan through everything. Boy, it's not any of those Jason films since I watched the whole catalog of Friday the 13th, but it is Women Talking. Now, technically it came out in 2022, I think making its way through all the film festivals and everything, but it really hit the US in 2023 and that's when I saw it. The quick synopsis, do nothing, stay in flight, or leave. In 2010, the women of an isolated religious community grapple with reconciling a brutal reality with their faith. And basically, and this is based off of a book, the premise is that some of the men, the younger men in their community have been raping their women. And the women, first of all, don't fully understand what has happened because they're younger. And uh, the older women know immediately, like, you know, if their daughters come to them, what has happened. And so, as I said, they can either do nothing and, and this cycle continues with the new batch of, of sons. They can stay and fight what is happening or they can just leave the community. And because the women aren't allowed to read, I can't remember if it was on a louder, they just aren't taught. But there is a young man there that uh, I think went off to get educated and and he is there writing everything down. And then when they come to vote, they actually draw pictures. Uh, there's a picture of like staying, fighting, and then and so they they write down which they choose. This is such a compelling film. It's literally a group of women talking in a barn. And you would think just from that, oh, this is going to be terribly boring. But I was fully engaged that entire time, getting to know each of those characters, getting to know their history. Some of them are really, you know, even like the toughest ones. You're like, what? And then you realize, oh, it's also happened to her. Trying to, you know, figure out why is this happening? Some people like excusing the, the, the young men and some people there's no excuse for it. It's just really, it's really powerful. Uh, the casting is great. Claire Foy's in there and Rooney Mara. They say Frances McDormand, but she's really only in like two to five minutes. That's pretty interesting. And it's pretty great, but there are like some things that kind of cut the tension at moments that you, you kind of get a breath of fresh air. Like one of the characters, there was dust on her glasses and you see her, someone's like seriously talking and you see her like looking around and she's like, I'm so sorry. I think I'm dying because she can't see through the glasses. And then everyone's like, it's just your glasses are dirty. So it's like, it gives you a moment to breathe because everything is so heavy. But I, yeah, I highly recommend this. I won't spoil to say what they end up choosing, but I was not expecting this to be as uh amazing and powerful as it ended up being my best or my favorite bad movie which sometimes I know that a movie is not going to be 
like it won't really hold up, you know, with awards or or any merit, but I will find it entertaining, like all the after films based on that series. I find those bad movies. This I accidentally found because I had gotten, I was leaving Cape Cod. I was leaving tea ticket to go down. And so I got two films because that's a 10 hour train ride. One was this one, my fault or Copa Mia. And the other one was, I think the extraction two. And this was a surprise. Now, first of all, I was a bit bummed because I could tell immediately that they had dubbed it and it was in another language, which I did not know at the time that I downloaded it on Amazon Prime. So I loved it so much or found it like so engaging and, uh, and amazing that when I went home and I was unpacking, I ended up watching it in its original Catalonian, I believe. So here's the tagline. You can see where the synopsis here it is. Noah has to leave her town, boyfriend, and friends behind and move into the mansion of her mother's new rich husband. There she meets Nick, her new stepbrother. She soon discovers that behind the image of a model son, Nick is hiding something. And in fact, romance blossoms. It's one of those we can't do this sort of thing, but they do between step siblings. So it is. <sighs> Merit wise, probably the same as the after films, but I think it's actually the quality is better. And I think there are two more and I'm excited for it. So that's my favorite bad movie. You can find that for free on Amazon Prime. My favorite sporting event of 2023 is the New York, New Jersey Gotham winning the NWSL championship. I think I talked about this in October, maybe, or last episode and just like, uh, the queer gods are smiling. The fact that, you know, we have these two people, Ali Krieger and Megan Rapino, queer icons retiring, soccer icons retiring, meeting. And it was unfortunate for Megan who got injured or re-injured like right at the beginning. So she was out, but then Gotham ended up winning. And of course, Ali Krieger is my favorite player. And it was just awesome for them to have their first championship and for her to have her first championship as well. And so now to have more medal uh, because she's got an Olympic medal of some sort, I'm pretty sure, and two World Cup championship medals. So my favorite live event is 100%. They're popping up again. The Alley and AJ VIP experience. I think I gushed over this when it happened. So I don't, again, need to go through everything, but they're just such warm and delightful people. And, you know, I always fear when I'm going to meet someone that I really am enamored with or respect highly, or I'm just such a fan that it's going to be unfortunate because you never want to meet your heroes but this was just amazing they're lovely and I got to like spit out everything I wanted to say to them and of course it was a little pricey but I think it's just one of those YOLO situations you only live once and if you love you know a band that much take a chance and and do this and I'm still thinking about it yeah it's just one of my my favorite things I should have I have a picture of me with them I should have posted it here or brought it up but uh, if you're a friend, friend with me on Facebook and I think on Instagram I also posted it uh, you'll see me with the two of them maybe in the break I can I can pull it up and then finally you know I call this a socio-political event and I did that last time with Sally Yates's report on the NWSL the league and and um sexual harassment and assault and things that were going on there and investigating that. And really I feel like I should rename it to human rights topic, my favorite human rights topic, because when you say uh, sociopolitical, it makes it sound like it is optional and whether depending on which side you are on will determine uh, your belief in that. But really the Sally Yates report there's no side to be on. The, the only side is being on the side of the Sally Yates report and asking for change, demanding change to make soccer safe and and usher in youth and be sure that they're protected. And so in in the same vein, there's really no choice here. You can well, there is actually you can choose to be a good teacher or a bad teacher. So. My human rights topic is, in fact, my favorite course this semester. And I think maybe my favorite course, I did really love my literacy courses and that YA literature. But the one that has really helped me grow the most was this cross-cultural education course. It was about multiculturalism. And we 
there's there are a lot of terms that come with this. So you might have heard of multicultural education. You might have heard of uh, culturally responsive teaching, which has the or pedagogy, but uh, teaching, I think, is more often used. And of course, it has CRT as the abbreviation. And then when people read that, they get really, <sighs> they, they get nervous about it because they think about critical race theory, which, my gosh, I mean, there are all of these things that people are upset about in education, uh, the stakeholders anyways, or culturally sustaining pedagogy. So you might have heard all of those. And I will define, because I, I think you there are some wrong answers to what multicultural education is. Um, and there are a lot of different right answers. And for me, I will read from my final paper in that class, just the, yeah, it's only one paragraph there, on what multicultural education is. Okay. So multicultural education is necessary for the psychological and physiological well-being of our students. It is complex and at times contradictory in requiring us to understand the distinct identities that make up each individual student while instructing us to consider the student holistically as a human made up of many intersections of identity rather than a representative of one or two cultural aspects. It incites us to design curriculum that goes beyond heroes and holidays and instead considers various perspectives, including those from oft forgotten subordinated groups. Multicultural education seeks to repair historical sociopolitical tensions by delivering equity in the classroom so that each student has opportunity, whatever that opportunity may be. It removes deficit language from the mouths of educators, administrators, politicians, and others, and transforms student profiles from at risk to at promise. Finally, multicultural education is a cycle which requires self-education, practice, reflection, revision, and growth. So just to give you that idea. So it's something that, again, th there are some contradictions or tensions within it. Like I said, you know, you need to see this person as all the distinct identities, but also, hey, they're a full human. And so how do you engage all that? You also want to pull out their culture, right? So if I'm teaching someone who's from Mexico, like, oh, I'm going to try to use that. But you also don't want to use it in the way that you are othering them and that you're really focusing on the fact that they're from Mexico. And so now they feel set apart from other people who are not from Mexico. So you do, it's, it's a lot about uh, being sensitive and respectful of your students. And I will say it talks about, you know, this was my philosophy of being a multicultural educator. And of course, it's, it's definitely a future tense because I'm not, well, I can do some stuff right now in the classroom as a sub, but I don't have mine yet. And very much I focus on relationships and building that through something that is not maybe explicitly their identity, but connected to their identity. So perhaps a shared love of reading, getting to know a student and building a relationship with them through that. And then hopefully through the different pieces that you're reading, they get to know you and begin to trust you and also your thoughts and feelings on different aspects. And then that can build into, into a, a deeper, more trusting relationship. The classroom environment that you're modeling behavior and empathy and that it's, it's creating a safe space. Um, that is respectful of all cultures and bringing all cultures to the forefront, having communication with your colleagues. Uh, maybe you don't have a good relationship with a student, but somebody else does. And so you can tap into that and, and find out, you know, what's going on with this student. Maybe they're having a not so good day or for subs as a sub, please, my gosh, leave sub plans and also be specific to certain students because there was a student that uh, a teacher told me um, she doesn't like to work in class because she feels like she, I don't know, if she struggles with something, maybe she'll feel stupid. And so it's better for her to work elsewhere. And so had I not been told that, I wouldn't have written her a pass to the library, you know? So I'm like, absolutely go to the library so you can do this work and be on your own and not feel self-conscious about things. So certain things like that. And then uh, the future is just like, now I know what to look for, for my school. And I'll hear from administrators and um, other teachers talking about their school, what they believe in and, and what it's actually like. Uh, I do want to read my conclusion just because you can see how much I've grown. And then I'll talk about two areas in which I'm struggling 
think there was a third, but I've, I've forgotten it. So uh, I didn't realize how far I had to go to become a multicultural educator until I entered this course. Despite priding myself on being a loving and empathetic individual who seeks to be humanistic and constantly looks for self-improvement through education and diverse interactions. The readings have taught me so much about culture and identity, and no other course has caused me to take so much time to reflect on my teaching career and interactions with others. While I hold myself accountable to my actions and almost immediately apologize and learn from an experience, this class gave me the opportunity to reach out to students of the past, speak to them about their experiences, and apologize for not protecting them, or perhaps even perpetuating problematic practices that were a part of the private school's hidden curriculum. For some of these conversations, I've also learned what I've done right. And while each student is different, I plan on making sure that I exhibit these practices more consistently. I cannot promise to be a perfect multicultural educator, but in a profession where the main responsibility is to safeguard students and train them to be good citizens, it is paramount that I continue on this journey with humbleness and a willingness to learn and change. And uh, I think that's what I consistently try to do. But this, yeah, this course was just really made me think a lot. And like I said, I did reach out to other students. And well, for both good and ill, I I really didn't consider students, uh, their differences. So when I had students that were, let's say Latina, uh, or Latino, uh, I really was treating everyone the same, just with like, I think real equality, I'll use equality, not equity, and um, just loving them all. And I think that's great because I'm not treating everyone, anyone differently. But then also, I think the students are suffering because they are just treated like everyone else. And so the fact that one of their identities is, is not really being looked at and ignored, I think is dangerous. So, you know, I did apologize to some students and one student didn't want to talk to me about her experiences and kind of wondered why I was asking, which is fine. I, I didn't have that strong of a relationship with her, but I was interested. And another one said that um, my class, she felt that she loved my class and she felt like she could be herself in it. And so that's really all I want. But now I know like more things that I can do to really harness um, different cultures and, and make it a great class. So I'm just super excited couple of things that I'm struggling with. First thing is front stage racism, which I found out in this class. So backstage and front stage racism, and these were termed, I, I'm not sure if they're a term, if it's a term that has come up elsewhere, but in Banks, this multicultural education textbook that we had. So backstage is, I think what you would expect, you're with a group of, let's say, w- with white people, and you're making racist jokes and everything, but there's not a person of color with you. So that's like, no one can see what you're doing. So it's backstage. Front stage racism is, for example, example, if you're just being like outwardly and ostentatiously nice to maybe a person of color, that's where they're like, oh, ah," you know, and it seems like, oh, this is what's going on here. And I, uh, when I read that, I was like, "I, I do that. I do that. Now it's not, I don't turn around and then start talking about that person. So my struggle is, I, the reason why I'm doing that is because, uh, for example, Michaels, because there are people every there, everywhere, or all types of people that are coming into Michaels. So say someone from the Muslim community comes in there because I know that they have, and probably unfortunately will continue to have bad times often at the hands of white people. I want to reassure someone that I'm not that. And so try, try to make a safe space. So I do try to be overly nice to sort of disarm them and like, Hey, it's okay here. And so I do want to like, I think technically that is front stage racism. And I asked one of my peers who was teaching and is from the middle East. I was like, this is what I do. Cause she was even talking about, she would at the beginning of the course kind of look at at white people mostly and and immediately have a judgment and i'm like well unfortunately you're not wrong about that but she had like come around to certain things that they're they're not all so bad and i'm like well you know experience shows you that unfortunately and so i said like i do this i mean would you if someone did that if a white person came up to you and was like that would you find that disingenuous and she said no so i i'm just struggling i guess with with uh that because technically again it is front stage racism but the intent behind it is honestly to like cry, try to uh, ha- have have them feel comfortable and not feel like something might happen to them because i am white so Struggling with that. Number two, struggling with this intersectionality of identities and can Christian schools 
be multicultural centers. And I think, uh, and I, I've been having this discussion with a former colleague of mine, obviously in terms of race and class, those identities, I think, and, and nationality, I would say that that sh- should be easy. You definitely need, I think, people in the building as well as on the board um, and administrators to be representative of those as well. Like if you just have a bunch of white people in the administration, it's not going to be helpful. But where I struggle is if we have, and undoubtedly you will, Christian schools, uh, queer students, how can you fully be a multicultural institution if you are ignoring a piece of um, the students' identities. And so I, I do wonder about that, especially now because a lot of schools, Christian schools, are putting out these, along with the statement of faith, which, hey, that's easy for me to sign, are these statements of like very specific black and white details, um, specifically when it comes to the um, LGBTQ plus communities. And I'm like, ooh. So first of all, if you're saying you're non-denominational, all of a sudden now you're not because those are very specific denominational ideas. And number two, like you are now saying, like, I'm going to uh, say that this identity of yours, like you better keep it hidden because I'm not going to be addressing it at all. And so I do wonder about that. And then my third thing that I'm currently working with is just um, as a white educator, some of the practices that were brought up in both the Banks and then the Paris and Aleem textbook, you just have to be careful, right? Be- and, and that's where the relationships come into play. Because if I am, say, using Spanish, which I actually recently did because I was in ESOL sub for the past three days and some students do not speak any English whatsoever. And so one student was asking me to help with a cup of noodles, uh, which I was thinking about back girls the entire time, but um, he was pointing to the microwave and I said, agua primo. So I was like using very basic Spanish of things I knew, but just like saying we need water first um, and doing just little things. Or if I didn't know where the cup of noodles were and I'm like, donde, you know, just things like that. So as a, you know, a white person, I think I just don't want it to be like from the perspective of the student, you're making fun of me. So it has to be genuine if you're using their language. If you, for example, decide to bring hip hop into the curriculum, which is uh, coming from Paris and Aline's text on a sustaining culture, which I think this authenticity and being genuine, you have to have the relationship first, which is why I think that's paramount. Because if I just come in and day one, let's do some hip hop stuff, they're gonna be like, who's this white teacher? And why is she doing this? But if you build this relationship and have trust and mutual respect, then I think those students know that I'm trying to reach out to you. And I'm trying to engage your culture um, out of respect, because I want to sustain that culture rather than, you know, I'm making fun of you. Um, But just something to like, caution, you know, any educator who might be listening to this, that don't just start throwing Spanish because sometimes it's like cringy. Like, why are you or is what's the intent there? But, you know, hopefully they can get a sense. I think also facial expressions are going to embody language. Like if you're laughing and you're saying dumb day, ha ha ha, that's not the way to go about. But I was being like legit. I was just trying to reach out to them and also hopefully use the language a little bit. Like I, I texted Cindy. I was like, Cindy, you would be both proud and embarrassed of the Spanish I used and, and just showed her. And she's like, you know, I thought that was pretty good. So ah, there you go. So that's my 2023 wrapped all of those things. And um, please, yeah, email me and let me know if you have any top moments or what you think about multicultural education. I think it's great. I'm, I'm just super excited. I can't wait to get back into the classroom and have students and start to, to put this into play because I have some great ideas for Latin. I have got some great ideas, so I'm excited about it. But yeah, so I think that's it. So I'm going to take a break. Yeah. When I come back, I will cover, well, Birds of Prey, volume five, number four. I'll do some listener emails and I guess anime watch list as well. But first, Zias's Radio Hour featuring my number one song of 2023. So you can hear what I'm talking about with harmonies. Not Strong Enough by Boy Genius. See you soon.
Welcome back. Came back. Got a new haircut. <laughs> also got a Christmas gift from my good friend Tom Penneries. So it's very productive so far. But now we have part two. And here, this is the uh, the picture. Maybe I haven't shared it, but there you go with Allie and AJ with love from. And uh, they commented on my pants, which I wore that in particular to to match with that shirt that I got uh, when I went to see them uh, for their a touch at the beat tour so again just lovely lovely humans and uh i recommend yeah giving their stuff a listen especially their new stuff if you're just like oh that's disney pop then try their new stuff just just to see where they are i think they're just great artists okay so let's do some listener emails mail time the mail's here come on Here's the mail, it never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. This will transition well to talking about Birds of Prey. Kelly Thompson somewhat did a listener email, uh, which responded, and then that will transition because it was via uh, Twitter, ex Twitter, that uh, that will transition well to talking about something that happened there. So it's all connected. So uh, I only have some YouTube comments on episode two forty one, part one. We've got Bagels After Midnight, who is my now. Uh, I did call my what was it? publicity stunt boyfriend but i think it doesn't work as well it doesn't really slide off the tongue i think emergency contact would be great which uh he was for that 5k that i did so i, I think we'll we'll say here is my uh emergency contact i think that works well so this is what he says in my defense the sea slug was a dangerous sea slug poisonous and multi-fanged i knew better than to approach it like a friendly dog like a certain pair of scientists in a certain alien prequel, but would Stella have overcome her instinct for affection? Quote, it's my life's goal to befriend all animals, end quote. Stella once told me over Chardonnay at the Linmar Estate in Sonoma Valley. And I've... <laughs> And I've remembered that ever since because while too bashful to voice it at the time, I shared the same dream. <sighs> It's been a difficult journey with trials and tribulations by way of, for example, sea slug bites. One knows how to extract slug venom from the victim's neck, and our relationship may be headed in that direction, but this episode is doubtlessly, regrettably, a bump in the road. So that's his, in his defense of not showing me the sea slug. And I responded to him, there is no defense for you. And then on part two, Shayna from Earth 2 says, I honestly can't believe how good this run has been regarding Birds of Prey. I know it is still early, but I think Thompson is leading us in a very satisfying and entertaining way to a good place. I really can't wait to see how this arc ends and what it does to our team. Their dynamics amongst our members are fantastic in a way I could have never dreamed. Can't wait to see where Thompson takes us. If you'd like other indigenous fiction, I recommend... Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, so she is about to recommend someone that I don't recommend. I'll read it and then I'll explain why. Uh, so she says, I recommend Sherman Alexie's The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, Autobiographical YA, Rebecca Roan Horses Between the Earth and Sky Trilogy, Fantasy, and Luis Erdick's, Erdick's The Round House. I also have to plug Tony Hillerman's detective books, Joe Leaphorn and Jim Chi. Hillerman wasn't indigenous, but he was honored by the Navajo Nation for depicting their culture with respect and exposing it to the world at a time when there was even less representation and it was more difficult for Native voices to be heard. Uh, so thank you because... Yeah, I've been thinking about and talking to other people about indigenous people representation uh, and things like that. So I appreciate that. So the reason why I'm not going to read Sherman Alexi and I've struggled with seeing those recommendations elsewhere, both at school, at, at university, some of the classes where uh, he is recommended or talked about in uh, articles and things like that is uh, he is someone who was on the bad side of Me Too. He was brought under fire for some activities. And this is one of those things where I can't 
get behind death of the author. I think, honestly, I really don't ever. I think even though he is a representative of it, I'm not going to read. I mean, I'm already giving him a platform by mentioning his name here, but I'm, yeah, I'm not going to read. I wouldn't bring it up in, um, you know, if I were an English teacher, I'd find something else other than him uh, because of that. And I know some of the articles, like I brought it up, man, where did I, it must've been in my cross-culture education. I think there was an article that brought him up on something. And then I, even in one of my discussion posts said like in the article authors, in the journal authors defense, this was before that stuff had come to light. So like, we can't really get on her, but you know, at what point do we stop sharing this man's work? Um, so obviously, you know, uh, nothing, nothing, uh, against you there, Shana, but, um, I personally am not going to be reading or recommending anything by that man. And I mean, to each his own, everyone's gotta, gotta do what they want. So I, I would rather lift other people up than him. So yeah, very unfortunate that there's a dearth obviously of indigenous representation. And then someone that is in that uh, demographic has to go and do that. So there you go. So I'll move on from uh, the, from that. The last thing was just after I had posted the previous episode. And I had that one question about, um, I can't even remember what the quote was, but it was about Barda and Wonder Woman. And I think Harley was talking to Barda and was asking, I guess, what would happen if you went toe to toe? And uh, the word push was used. And I took it to mean like, Wonder Woman would just push her. But I was corrected, uh, which is great. I appreciate that. And it was good because it will come into play in this issue. So Kelly Thompson actually responded to that uh, and said, thanks for reading. So glad you're enjoying it. Regarding push, a push means you're pretty evenly matched, that it will be a close fight to win. So I did not know that particular definition of push. That's great. And then also regarding transgender Amazons, Kelly Sue DeConnick's Amazon Historia series addresses this in incredible ways. And I did read that. So I think we're good. So the answer is yes, uh, Themyscira would have uh, transgender women on there. And I had asked someone, I asked like two different people. One person said they probably wouldn't because it's probably an island full of turfs, which is like real bad. And then I also asked Professor uh, Carolyn Coca and... She said that it probably it depends on the writer, which I fully, fully uh, agree with that. And then um, she had also listened to that episode and said Philippus was actually a uh, creation before this. Professor Coca said Philippus was created by Perez. And although he was clear about wanting the Amazons to be more diverse, I never thought about the us uh, until you mentioned it, so the U.S. there. I don't know what he intended, if anything, about her gender. He wrote her as the lead general protector of Hippolyta, trainer of Diana. Uh, I think I read somewhere that some old classic, in some old classic, there was a Philippus with an I-S, so I assume that's where he got it, which I-S as an ending, because of that declension, could be masculine or feminine, so... And then the the pronunciation with it is, um, so he could could have transitioned it there. Yes, I do, however, think even after reading the um, Kelly Sue DeConnick's uh, writing there, unless I missed something, I don't think that a transgender male Amazon would be allowed to continue to reside on Themyscira, which is both positive and negative obviously we're, we're kicking somebody off but it's positive in the way of like well they're a man and so like you know their their true gender has been embraced so in that way it's it's a positive thing even though we're we're ejecting someone from that society so yes i have learned a great deal so far and so we are yes on the, the um, trans people on themiscara which is great so let's actually get into Birds of Prey, Volume 5, Number 4, mm, 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 Megadeth, Part 4. And here we have it, right? So Barda v. Diana, who will win? 
man, there are some amazing scenes in here in particular with the, the fighting for sure. So writer Kelly Thompson, art Leonardo Romero, colorist Jordi Belair, the publisher synopsis is uh, the birds versus the Amazon warriors. Chaos reigns as the first mission for the birds of prey has unsurprisingly gone sideways. Even with the collective battle prowess of her handpicked team, did Black Canary bring enough firepower to fight their way off the mascara? We'll see because the answer is not given to us in this particular issue. So it's interesting that I will say what I have said the past three issues, which is in regards to Zealot, that she's just a big old question mark for me. And that's again raised because we have her, this scene right here, that she and Diana clearly have a past, given Diana tells her she's forbidden from the island. And then later she says she's been in a cell before, or she says, I've been here before, which could either mean she's been in a cell before, or she's been in Themyscira before. But either way, it's sort of the same thing. So she's been here before. So what what's going on here? Still, I don't know her history. So I say this is interesting because um, in my laziness, which I've been pretty clear about, to find a synopsis for the previous issue, number three, I saw a review that gave issue three a low rating. And among other reasons, actually cites the fact that Thompson puts too much history and characters' pasts into the story. Now, while that reviewer stated this as a negative, I actually cite this as a positive. I feel like Thompson actually does a good job of balancing new and veteran readers. And the fact that Zealot and her motives are a mystery to me keeps me coming back and keeps me engaged. Now, if answers are never given, then, you know, I will have a problem and I'll be asking Thompson some questions. But I'm assuming right now that... Thompson is is going to follow through with this. It's also a funny reminder looking at this review. I skimmed it. I think it was by a man uh, that there are differing opinions in the world of fandom. I didn't like new 52 back row. I know others loved it. They loved the dark tone and I love this run with birds of prey and others may not, but so I'm going to take a little discursus diatribe segue. <sighs> May I remind others, especially in light of a weird and toxic ex-Witter conversation that happened Friday, maybe, between Thompson and, you know, I hesitate to say, quote unquote, fans, that we should be kind to creators and maybe not dissect syntax and semantics unless we're giving a grade on a paper. Donovan had sent me a post that was in particular about, I think issue seven solicit had come out that was, that shows Batgirl, Batgirl fully. So hashtag Carolyn knows. And I think immediately, I think the, the thing after that was something about, you know, we owe Thompson an apology with, you know, maybe coming after her about we as in fandom, not having Barbara. And then it seemed I was barely following along, but then he sent something else. And then it was really going after it seemed like not assuming good intent on behalf of Thompson and a lack of representation, obviously, uh, but uh, really going after her being ableist and yeah, dissecting things that she was saying. Why is Barbara as background not Oracle? And, you know, first of all, I think sometimes, not all the time, we have to be careful. I had a discussion with someone recently about this. We should assume good intent. Uh, On the behalf of creators, I think we should also look at previous history. And Thompson really has given us no indication that (laughs) she would be ableist or she'd be like against having Barbara as Oracle. Barbara is in a tricky position right now, which is something that Thompson actually brings up continuity-wise because She's back girl and, and flinging herself around elsewhere. How can she be Oracle over here? We don't know. Like the solicitation, it's just a cover in, in a 
tagline. Like you cannot assume too much. We could go the route of back rolls where we see various aspects of her mobility because she was still a back roll there, but she was also Oracle sometimes that, that that's still a possibility. I think also, and I am guilty of this. So everything that I'm saying is not me being holier than now, but also being someone who was doing similar things to this with New 52 and Gail Simone. Simone. And so I think like I've obviously learned from that and I recognize that that's not the thing to do, but we also put a lot of pressure on creators as if they are the God of the creation. And I think we need to realize that it's maybe 50% that create, I think even that's too high a percentage, but you've got editorial and the powers that be making certain decisions that creators often don't have a say in. We know this from Simone. We know this from other Batgirl creators not being allowed to go to the Batman summit. Gosh, let's just be open-minded and also not go after Kelly Thompson. Uh, This is why, you know, creators, it's great when they're open and and are willing to talk to us, uh, but this is why they decide not to do that anymore because it's toxic. So let's, let's be kind um, and assume good intent here and wait and see, wait and see what happens with, with Barbara. So that's, that's all I ask. So, okay. That's the end of my uh, thing there. This is why I also probably stay off social media, frankly, but here we go. Let's continue. Uh, we do see what else was in Dinah's bag of tricks. Uh, these balls here that are called Banshees, part Satana, part Dinah. But it definitely reminds me back when Dinah's uh, canary cry was damaged on account of longbow hunters that she had tools like this where she would throw things and, and they would have a sauna cry. So I don't know if Thompson is uh, specifically hearkening back to that, but, but I did like that little call, at least for me. So after my previous review, as I talked about, uh, Thompson corrected me on push or using it properly. And I'm glad that she did because otherwise I would have been like, what's going on here? She said she couldn't have moved Diana. So, or Diana. So here we have it. Uh, this Barta Diana fight. Woo, boy. Uh, it's intense. It's brutal. It is well choreographed, artistically designed. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I, just, I mean, it's so dynamic. Uh, some things you don't need to see anything like just this fist and hair and some blood there you know i love when bane breaks batman's back so this is an, also an amazing homage and i'm just like goo barda breaking i mean or there's a crack so potentially maybe she's just giving her some chiropractic help but um yeah it's this is nuts this is nuts and then i think we even i mean that's this is crazy too just this almost one hit punching knocking her out and just again how it's designed and the layouts and everything just amazing and then I think we even step it up a notch I mean the brutality is not there but we have Cass and Diana and Cass has to because I think she's smart enough to realize that hand to hand uh, she's not going to fare too well against Diana's strength but she's using her ninja skills and subterfuge rather than direct confrontation but and she she's doing some great things here but then yo when she is smacked against the tree when does this happen Again, just, yeah, one hit. I'm hoping that Diana pulled her punch. I'm sure she did compared to Barda. But, uh, and then, yeah, Cass just getting laid out and hitting that tree. I do worry about her. She just says her ears are ringing at the end of the issue, but I do feel like maybe she should get her ribs checked as well. I do think each issue I should start picking out favorite Harley Quinn quotes In particular, I think this one, my favorite happens in this splash page, which again, very dynamic and fun. She says, uh, quote, there's so many of them. They're like extremely attractive roaches. (laughs) And then later on even says, sorry, beautiful roach. It's not personal as she hits somebody. So uh, I'll have to try to remember to do this. But yeah, the Harley quotes, uh, I'm living for them here. So I think my question, because I do have questions, I think, with with each issue, 
is this scene, um, the Barda and the lasso. Now, symbolically, I definitely understand this scene because Barda, she's not one to submit. She is a top 100%. But I do wonder why she resists answering the question when even she says Barda speaks only the truth. Plus, she dares Diana, she says, and see the truth if you dare. Um, She dares Diana to hear the truth. So I feel like uh, maybe the actions contradict the words. And I wonder, you know, if Diana had just said or asked Barta straight up, what are you doing here? Barta would have just maybe told her. Uh, but it's, yeah, kind of interesting here. So that would be kind of my only question of maybe not fully understanding, I think, this scene. So Stella, me, was right about... uh Megara being one of the Furies. So we are going with that. We learn a bit more about the threat and what sin has to do with it all. But obviously, there's still enough mystery to keep us going. And it'll be interesting once we reach the end of this arc, which I'm now assuming is six, once we look at this holistically, whether we can kind of pull back and be like, oh, maybe there were too many issues and and we could have cut down. Um, but enough is like... G- b- because we are kind of breadcrumbing a bit, like little details are given to us. But again, uh, you know, this story and the it, the writing, the art, it, it's also engaging that even if I am being given breadcrumbs, I'm completely engaged and still like, I can't wait to see what's what's happening here. Questions about, yeah, communication between the island and Dinah are answered because, you know, Sin was there. And Donna wasn't being told that Sin was there, but actually they had tried or potentially maybe tried. It seems like maybe Penelope was either bad or she was being manipulated by Megara and uh, was not did not share that communication. So that's answered. And then uh, these manacles here, I do wonder what they're made of. They look kind of magical, but then I think when they escape... I mean, they're made of, so I guess they are solid. So I am not sure. Cass was great in here. Uh, she doesn't play a huge role, but even s- this where Donna finally asked, where's Cass, by the way? Like everyone was there. And then she finally realizes, and Cass was never even in the cell to begin with. Uh, picture perfect back row, I feel like. And I also like this scene where Dinah and her leadership, yeah, right here, where she's actually checking in on Barda. So I think also we get to see who is Dinah as a leader and so checking in on her. And it's also a great, I don't know if Thompson wrote this into her script or just artistically, we we got this, but that bandage on the nose of Barda, I think also shows the 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 compa- the the love and the compassion at the very least of the Amazon. So even if you are you know erstwhile or temporary enemies, that they're going to care for you uh, once they put you in there because they they patch her up. Yeah, and then I guess just at the the very end, we do see Sin kind of out and about learning more about this because she's with Philippus and Diana. And then she is supposed to go over here, but she's not there yet. So at the end of the issue, she's supposed to go, sorry. She's supposed to go and find Dinah, but she's not by the time they get out. So I don't know where Sin is, which makes me a bit nervous. But we do see at the end of this, the stakes, the actual states stakes of this mission. We've been being told about it, but visually now that we see this fury and that, Diana, this great warrior who basically has knocked out all the birds and is kind of the leader of Themyscira, is under the control of or is uh, incapacitated by this fear. I think now we realize like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, this, this, uh, this could be a problem. So I think those are all my points on this particular issue. Obviously, art-wise, I try to talk about it as much as possible, but it's like, Everything I see, I just love it with the art. I, I hope that Romero is is able to stay on for a long time. I think I'm going to give this 9.5 out of 10. Uh, unlike Harley's grade for the mission, which was a 0 out of 10, won't do again. It was definitely a beat em up issue. Uh, we knew it was going to happen, okay? But between the hits, I think that there are some great character moments, not to mention the, like I said, the still amazing art. And uh, there was one 
box that grammatically I didn't care for as much. Um, but because just I would have rephrased it because it sounded a bit weird, but because of my diatribe on dissecting syntax and semantics, I've decided that I will uh, not be a hypocrite and I will I'll just let it go. So but that's just, you know, the teacher in me for sure. So again, we'll recommend and we'll continue to recommend this book. Okay, uh, next up, anime watch list. The Boy and the Heron, saw that in theaters. Day came out the 8th as a celebration of the end of my semester, the semester, my grad semester, I should say. So that was great. Synopsis, Mihito, a young 12-year-old boy, struggled to, struggles to settle in a new town after his mother's death. However, when a talking heron voiced by, would you believe, Edward Cullen himself, Robert Pattinson, informs Mihito that his mother's still alive. He enters an abandoned tower in search of her, which takes him to another world. So it's Miyazaki. It's Ghibli. Uh, his final one based off of, is it This Is How We Live or How I Live? Which is, or at least his experience of reading it, because that's, I read that book in preparation for this, but maybe like a year ago, not exactly like this. So it does make a little, there's a little uh, Easter egg with that book in here. Still kind of, you know, working through it. It's definitely a film that I want to see again, did see the dub. So I was interested in, in having uh, Robert Pattinson and there are other people that come back uh, like Willem Dafoe and Christian Bale trying to think if they're uh mark hamill that have been in other uh ghibli dubs and so i did see thematically some similarities between this and susan may so also trying to kind of separate those because i did really love susan may um but yeah highly recommend and i would say if i were to compare it with another miyazaki or ghibli spirited away is kind of kind of that feel um as well so there you go. Recommend. And then finally, we've got literature recommendations. I am, I've like changed my reading goal multiple times. I feel like I'm close. I could make it to 100 books this year, but uh, I don't know if I can. I'm like reading two, uh, two or three at the moment. So maybe I'll make it. Okay, so we'll start with this one, which is, it's the N-word, and it's fully spelled out. The Strange Career of a Troublesome Word by Randall Kennedy. I don't think I've talked about this. This was, I found it cited in a chapter of my multicultural education text. I was interested in it as someone who has struggled having a class where it's kind of uh, bandied about by people of color. Because any white person that was uh, saying that I'd, I'd be yelling at them. But yeah, it's interesting to see its history, especially in different topics like politics, law, and education. And Kennedy, a black man, uh, he argues against eradicationists who believe that it should never be used ever and um, says, you know, there are, it can be harnessed um, for activism or anti-racism or in an educational setting, right? So he does give an example of a professor that had a class kind of about uh, pejoratives and uh, this had been mentioned and then he came under fire. Um, some students complained about him, which was ironic given the fact that it was a class about pejoratives. So, you know, what place does it have? It's, but, you know, in education, if you're talking about a word or, or even in, in a law class and how it's being used, like, should you be allowed to use it? Now, I neither want nor need the privilege to say it, um, but I did read it in, in terms of like, Better understanding, I guess, why it's used, especially by um, that population and kind of how it's been reclaimed and then how I can argue against using it in a classroom setting from them, right? Just um, maybe that it's an inappropriate word for that particular environment. Uh, so that, that was the main reason. Also read The Color Complex, The Politics of Skin Color Among African-Americans by Kathy Russell, Midge Wilson, and Ronald Hall. It's been on my list for a while, and then I, I got a, a library card from someplace that I don't want to say because I don't live there and I don't want to get uh, myself or them in trouble. 
but I'm not using it for bad purposes. I just wanted to have more options. Uh, but colorism is something that I, I was really only recently made aware of probably in like 2020. And so just looking, investigating that a bit more colorism and textures and things like that. Multicultural education, issues and perspectives. Uh, I recommend it even if you're not in education. Robert E. Lee and me, a Southerner's reckoning with the myth of the lost cause by Ty Sidul. And this is a man who, see, at VMI, um, he was in the military, and and uh, this was lent to me without me asking, and it just took me a very long. I mean, I started reading it in September and just finished it, so I just was not like fully um uh, fully reading it, but it was interesting of him growing up, basically seeing that as many Southerners do, Robert E. Lee as a Southern god, and then kind of coming to terms with that as well as you know the civil war and what it was actually about beowulf by unknown uh and translated by seamus heaney and or haney and you can listen to tom and i talk about that and um hashtag gaywolf you'll see what that is on the next required reading wonder woman historia the amazons by kelly sudaconic and phil jimenez Book Lovers by Emily Henry, which I liked. And um, I liked that more than people we meet on vacation. And then finally, Mindfulness for Teachers, Simple Skills for Peace and Productivity in the Classroom by Patricia A. Jennings, who um, is or was a professor at UVA. And this was uh, for fun. It wasn't for class. Recently came upon Social Emotional Learning, SEL for short. And that that was one of the focus folky that you could pick for grad school. Obviously I have literacy as my focus, but someone in my um, thesis class spoke about it um, for her final presentation. And I had heard of it, but in negative terms by uh, a mother for Liberty on Instagram, that it's the new threat after CRT um, critical race theory. And I, I was just like, why, why, do people not like it? You know, what is, and so I want to know a little bit more. And it seems like a good thing. Like, I don't understand what the problem is. I think the main issue is not a lot of research, which there is research, but small um, focal groups. And it's really about sort of determining like self-determination of why you are acting this way or feeling this way and then self-regulation. So also like, examining why you're feeling this way or acting this way and then getting back to a, a level playing field and this is not only for students but also for teachers to take moments and this is great like especially for class management I think reading that it really helped me think better understand that class management is like 90% observation 10% action because if you have knee-jerk reactions to what a student is doing it might go poorly especially if you don't have a relationship with that student but if you are observing that student obviously if there is safety involved you need to act quickly but if you're observing what this person is doing and also preemptively like you are sensing that something's going to happen observing and then also considering like why is this person doing what they're doing because a, a, a lot of empathy right um this understanding like what's going on at home if they're hungry it's because they didn't have something to eat or maybe they had to keep t take care of their sibling because they're single parent and their parent is working and so they're in charge of the sibling and so now they are you know sleeping in class that sort of thing so if you are observing first and then acting rather than reacting better things will happen. So that was a great text for me. And I'm not sure I necessarily understand why social emotional learning would be a dangerous thing. So, uh, but I think more study for me definitely needs to happen. Uh, and I'll probably reach back out to that classmate and, and ask her more specific questions. So I think that's what we got. Like I said, I'm reading, I think three different books at the moment. I've got two manga that Donovan gave me for my birthday. So maybe I'll get to 100. I don't know. Thank you for listening. Remember, you can send any questions or comments to backworldoracle at gmail.com or even comment on the YouTube videos. Uh, I'd love to hear what your goals are for 2024 or if you have any favorites of 2023. Anything. Like the show on Facebook or follow it on Twitter or X Twitter at Backworld Oracle. Subscribe and be kind on Twitter.
Good Lord, be kind. Uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube for an uncut version. Follow the Batman Universe on Facebook and Twitter as well. And support the Batman Universe by subscribing to Patreon. Once again, thanks to Mile High Comics for sponsoring Back for the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. Thank you for listening to me for 14 years and 241 episodes. I do really appreciate you. Even if you don't reach out to me, I know you're out there and uh, I do this for me, but I also do this for you. So hopefully, hopefully I can brighten your day a little bit or, or educate you um, a little bit. And um, yeah, I just appreciate your time for sure. Happy holidays and uh, yeah, stay safe out there and love others. And until next time, fly on Babs lovers. Just plain Barbara Gordon masquerading for a lark as she rides into the night on her special Batgirl cycle. Who knows? Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? Only time will tell us more about this dazzling dare doll. Ah, I love a happy ending, don't you?